All right. Let me turn your attention now to the book of Ecclesiastes. If you found that, why don't you stand and we'll read together God's Word. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 and 2. Uh, we'll come back next week and pick up verses 1 through 11 and sort of take the whole passage like we normally would. But today what I want to do is let's just take these two verses and use that as an introduction to get us in to the book of Ecclesiastes. Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's begin verse 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now that's worth praying over. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would use your word to strip us bare before you. That we might throw ourselves on the mercy and the grace of God. Bring healing and hope. Restore joy. Take away all of our false idols that we might worship and love the one true God revealed to us in Jesus. And so help us, your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> In 1851, Herman Melville, you might recognize the name, Herman Melville wrote a novel of lasting acclaim, and the name of that no novel was The Well. You might know it as Moby Dick. And of all the worthy things that you might say about that book, Moby Dick, of all the worthy things said over the years by book reviewers and everyone else, any person that reads that book with a critical eye can't help but seeing how the Bible is stitched in and out of its pages. I don't know if, uh, I don't know if Melville was a Christian or not. He did own a King James Bible, and it is said that his King James Bible was careworn, read through, and marked through, and the book in the Bible that Melville marked the most was the book of Ecclesiastes. E even in the book itself, even in Moby Dick itself, Melville writes that, uh, that the truest of men is the man of sorrows. He's talking about Jesus. The truest of the men is the man, uh, the truest of men is the man of sorrows, and the truest of books is the book of Ecclesiastes. I love this little book. I love the book of Ecclesiastes for several reasons. I, I love Ecclesiastes because when I was in seminary learning how to be a preacher there in seminary, my favorite professor, the one that, uh, that, that had the, the biggest effect on my preaching, my Hebrew professor, he wrote his dissertation. His name was Rick Byerjohn. He wrote his dissertation on the book of Ecclesiastes, and because he loved Ecclesiastes, I loved Ecclesiastes. I, in fact, I carry a fountain pen in my pocket probably because he did. I got cufflinks on probably because he did. I love this book because Rick Byerjohn loved this book. But that's not the only reason to love this book. I love this book because it's short. I love this book because you could read it in one reading and get the full punch of Ecclesiastes. I love this book because it confronts, it confronts problems head on. Doesn't give us any pat answers. I love this book because the book of Ecclesiastes is going to ask the questions that the other 65 books in the Bible are lined up to answer. Namely, why? Why are things the way they are? Why is there injustice in the world? Why did this happen to me? Why can't I have a lasting legacy? Life is dull. Uh, life is not fair. 
I'm sometimes clouded with depression. I'm getting older and I'm still not happy and I want to know why. That's what you're going to find here in Ecclesiastes. Kent Hughes wrote the book, uh, Disciplines of a Godly Man, wrote lots of other books. He's a really good preacher. Kent Hughes says that the book of Ecclesiastes is the only book in the Bible that was written on a Monday. Derek Kidner, an Old Testament scholar who really writes, his commentaries are almost like devotionals. Derek Kidner, he says that the book of Ecclesiastes, that in this book, wisdom, remember it's wisdom literature, Proverbs and Job and Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, wisdom. Here in Ecclesiastes, wisdom is the base cap. Think of wisdom as where the author is going to live. Wisdom is the base camp. And the author of Ecclesiastes is an explorer and he goes and he pushes on the boundaries. If you're a teacher, you've had this student. The author of Ecclesiastes, he is the student in the classroom that when you answer his question, he says back to you, yeah, but, but what about this? Ecclesiastes is a... It's a, it's a bucket of cold water thrown on the American dream, and right now we could use a little reality. Ecclesiastes, when you read it, you, you, you feel it. it. It gives us space. Ecclesiastes allows for the questions, why? Why am I so unhappy? Why is there injustice? Ecclesiastes lets you walk over into the shadow and ask the question, is life really worth living? Ecclesiastes, this book, I love it so much because it, it offers a perspective on human life. It, it, it unmasks the myth of, of human achievement. It unmasks the myth of human autonomy. It takes away the myth of self-sufficiency. And this book shows us our own inability to find real meaning in such a crooked world. We, we need, we need this book. Ecclesiastes is, is needed right now because it exposes the mad quest that we're all on to find some sort of satisfaction it, it exposes the mad quest to find satisfaction in knowledge for all, all of you that are smart and love to learn, like to go to school. It, it says, you're not going to find satisfaction there. In fact, uh, one of my favorite verses in Ecclesiastes is near the end of the book where it says, the author says that um, of the making of books, there is no end and much study is weariness of the flesh. I love that verse. It tells us that you're not going to find satisfaction in knowledge. He the writer here is going to tell us, you're not going to find satisfaction in stuff and in pleasure. We'll go in chapter 2 and chapter 3, and he'll list all the great things that he has. He's the king in Israel. He'll, he'll talk about his power. You're not going to find satisfaction in power or in money. He'll list all of the things that he's been able to do because of how rich he is. You'll not find satisfaction in fame. He'll even bring up, which has become sort of the God of this day, is sex. And he'll say, you'll not find it there. This, this book is um, it's a necessary part. This book is a sandblaster. This book is a power washer that you're going to use on your driveway to clean it up. This book strips us bare. Leaves us with nothing to stand on but the grace of God found in Jesus Christ. So today what I'd like to do is just point you to a broad theme for today's sermon. A broad theme. And I would just say it like this. Don't. Don't build your life on lies. Lots of lies out there. Don't build your life on lies. Build your life on Jesus Christ. Now, today will be a little bit different than my normal fare. Normally, we'll read a passage, I'll do the introduction, give you the theme, and then do an exposition of the, of the passage. 
Today what I want to do is I, I want to set the stage. I want this to be an introduction to the book of Ecclesiastes. I want you to get a feel for this enigmatic little book. So here's how we're going to do it. I want to give some meaning to some words, um, go through and just talk about uh, what you see in the title here, and then maybe near the end of our time together, uh, I just would uh, give you a couple of truths to hang on to near the end of our study this morning. So think of, of this morning more like a study than like a sermon. With that being said, let's start with the title. You have your Bible open. You're, you have it open to the book of Ecclesiastes. That word Ecclesiastes, where does that come from? Well, if you've been in church very long, you hear uh, Ecclesiastes, it sounds like a Ecclesia, ecclesiastical, having to do with church. That is a Greek translation meaning assembly. It's a Greek translation of a Hebrew word called koheleth. Koheleth. It comes from the very beginning in verse 1, the words of the preacher. You see that word preacher? Preacher is koheleth, the one that calls an assembly. The one that gathers people together, presumably to teach something or to preach in some kind of way, that's where the title Ecclesiastes comes from. That's why it sounds so much like ecclesiological, the study of the church. That's why it sounds so much like church. Ecclesiastes, the preacher. Okay, with that being said, who then is the author of this book? You know the title, Ecclesiastes, comes from Kohelet, the preacher. Who is the author? Well, we really don't know. Technically, it's anonymous. It is written by someone we don't know, but Jews and Christians for millennia have always thought that Solomon wrote this book because you read the words of the preacher, the son of David, the king in Jerusalem. He's never mentioned in this book, but it feels like, feels like he wrote it. I mentioned uh, Rick Byerjohn, my favorite pr professor. He, he always thought that uh, there was an anonymous writer and that put on a Solomonic mask is what he said. I, I think probably it's easiest, the plainest reading is to see that Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. Okay, we've got the title, and we have the author. What are the themes? What, what do you look for in the book of Ecclesiastes? Well, you, you find it really in verse 2 is, is we find a theme right there. You're going to be lots of other major themes. You're going to talk about life under the sun. We're talking about what you can gain. We're talking about what work does for us, the brevity of life. A lot of other little themes that are nuanced throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. But one prevailing theme drives this book it's in verse 2. In fact, if you were to flip to the end of Ecclesiastes, you would find it in chapter 12, verse 8. So think of it like bookends. Chapter 1, verse 2 says something. Chapter 12, verse 8 says the exact same thing. And that becomes the theme of the book and everything between those two describe what it means. Well, what is the theme? You find it right there in verse 2. Vanity of vanities says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Well, you got the theme, and, and in order to understand it, we need to get a grasp on the word vanity. Vanity really is not a great, um, <clears throat> it's not a great translation of the word because we use the word vanity. If we say someone is vain, we talk about them you know, really in love with themselves, love to look in the mirror, that sort of thing. Vain. That's not what this means. The word vanity comes from the Hebrew word havil, H-A-V-I-L, if you like to write down those things, havil. In fact, if you were reading it in Hebrew, it would go havil, havilim, havil, havilim, vanity of vanities. The word vanity is used 38 times in this one little book. Which is amazing because this is 12 chapters and in the rest of the Bible it's just used 30 times in the rest of the, the whole rest of the Bible. Vanity. Has multiple nuanced meanings. It means something like breath or vapor or mist or smoke or in philosophically it means something that is unsolvable. 
It's the idea of when you go to the eye doctor and you sit there in front of that metal mask and he says, okay, I'm going to put a puff of, puff of air into your eye and a puff of air comes. It's real. You feel it, but then it's gone. Uh, a breath on a, on a cold day this morning went out and cranked my car and as I walked, I breathed and I could see my breath for a little bit and then it's just gone. It, it's real, but the, it's, it's, it's nothing you can actually get your hands on. It's nothing you can sink your life into. It's not to say that it's not real. Don't think that it's not real. It's just to say that it's a whisper on the wind. An enigma. That's the way Rick Barjan translated it. Okay, that's the meaning of vanity. You need to have that idea of the word vanity because you're going to see it over and over and over and over and over again in the book of Ecclesiastes. Okay, so then let's just talk about the gospel a little bit in the book of Ecclesiastes. Where do you actually find the gospel? In other words, how do we as Christians, how do we read this book and how does it actually become a means of sanctification in our lives? How do we interpret it? How do we use the book of Ecclesiastes? Because there is no other book in the entire Bible quite like the book of Ecclesiastes. There's no other writer in the Bible quite like the preacher. I mean, you read it in first blush. But when you first read it, it feels pessimistic. It, it feels skeptic-like. And for all of you that are pessimists or you people think you are pessimists, you, with, it's like with so many other pessimists, you've got to stay with them a minute. Because they're easily misunderstood, especially if they're Christian pessimists. You stay there and, and listen. you got to stay here in Ecclesiastes and listen. What you find out is that God is here. This is not written as some atheist that doesn't believe in God. This is a book that, that God has woven into the very fabric of this book. God is introduced as, as creator. He's introduced as sovereign over all things. He's introduced as the one who is inscrutably wise. You read it now, and what you find out is that God is to be feared. He is to be worshipped. In fact, Ecclesiastes Ecclesiastes exposes the gap between a God who is holy and mankind who are sinners. The theme of the Bible. It shows us our need. Our need for the gospel. This gap that can only be filled by the perfect life, the atoning death of Jesus, and the resurrection of Christ. Okay, so... That sort of works us through the introduction of, of the first two verses. You get a couple of ideas on, on, on what it feels like. What I'd like to do in, in the few moments we have remaining, <clears throat> I'd like to do what the Puritans used to do. I'm not going to do this with the, whole pat, with the whole book. We'll probably take one chapter a week and go through it fairly quickly. But what I'd like to do this morning, I want to take these two verses. I want to just squeeze them a little bit. Let's you and I just squeeze these two verses and see what we can take away. Here's a couple of things you might take away. Number one, <clears throat> perspective is helpful. It's helpful to have perspective. If Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes, and I believe he did, if Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes, we understand that he wrote two other books, the book of Proverbs and the Song of Solomon, or the Song of Songs. So, Song of Songs, the book of Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. Many believe that Solomon wrote the Song of Songs when he was a young man. Go and read it sometime. Only a young man talks like that. He, he wrote it when he was a young man. His eyes would be quickly turned to a beautiful woman, and that's going to get him in danger. You go read about his life. He wrote the Song of Solomon when he was a young man. Others believe that not only did he write the Song of Solomon when he was young, that when he wrote the book of Proverbs, he was in middle age and he was living out some of these things. 
Go and read Proverbs, and it really is descriptively, this is how the world works. Giving advice to his son, this is how it works. But when he got to Ecclesiastes, he was an old man. He can look back on his life and he had done everything, he had been everywhere, he had had everything, he had turned his back on God, he had, been, he had chased after women to the degree that he had forgotten even the God that he was to worship. And his life comes back to God. And he says in Ecclesiastes, I have chased every one of these things and I'm still empty. found satisfaction in God alone. You know what you learn here by perspective? You don't have to learn every lesson the hard way. Let me just look at me. You don't have to learn every single lesson the hard way. You, you always heard that experience is the best teacher, that you, that becomes a lesson you learn through experience. You don't have to learn every one of the lessons you learn in life through experience. You can look and hear the perspective of somebody that's been there. If you're young here, you, you've got the Bible, you have the church, you have Christian men and women that have walked the path, many of whom are telling you things that you should and shouldn't do, and you just need to learn from their perspective. I mean, one of the things that Solomon says in chapter 5 is, look, God is in heaven. You are on earth. Let your words be few. You know what that is? That's the perspective of somebody that's been there. And is now pointing you to the futility of a life without Christ. You don't have to learn every lesson the hard way. Perspective is important. Let me give you another thing to consider from this passage. <clears throat> You'll see it in verse 1. It's the words of the preacher. And that is that words have, words have power. Words have power and God's word has the most power. Right there in verse 1. The words, these are the words of the preacher. You know what that is? That is an official introduction. You, you find the same sort of wording in the prophets, Amos, also in Jeremiah, that here is the word of the Lord. It's an official introduction. Even, even Jesus on the road to Emmaus with the disciples after the resurrection, and he was teaching them that everything in the Word, the Bible, points to me. Now this word, Ecclesiastes, and I hope you'll use it in the next few months. The book of Ecclesiastes has the power to melt away all the stuff that does not matter so that you can cling to the things that do matter. And there's so much in life that is in your life right now that doesn't matter and is blocking some of the things that do matter. And Ecclesiastes helps us. It takes us to the point where we can cling to God and His gospel. That, that you can... That you can drill your security into Jesus, his perfect life, his death on the cross for your sins, his resurrection, the forgiveness of sin. That, that you can find your joy in the Lord. You're keeping your eyes glued on the news, worried about, worried about being banned from social media. Look, you, who cares if you're banned... You need to ban social media. Get our eyes back here. Ecclesiastes strips away all of those things that are not going to matter in life. Reminds us that words have power, but the Word of God has the most power. Let me give you a third thing that you're going to find in the book of Ecclesiastes, and I think you can find it in these couple of verses. <clears throat> Some of you learned this already. Life is perplexing. It's perplexing. It's just confusing. On so many levels, I mean, it's right there in the theme, verse 2 and in chapter 12, verse 8, and that theme is vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities. A couple of things about that, that, that verse. There's lots about that verse. Let me just give you two things. Once it's, it's said twice, vanity of vanity, says the preacher, vanity of 
vanities. That is for emphasis. Anytime you see something like that, it said for emphasis. There you have it two times. There's the statement. Go to the very end of the book. It said twice again. There's the statement. But more than that, this speaks to life being confusing in the highest degree. See that phrase, vanity of vanities, vanity of vanities. That should uh, ring a bell for you. You've, you've read the Bible before. You, you know that if you saw the temple in the Old Testament, there was a spot inside the temple that was holier than any other spot. It was called the Holy of Holies. So in Hebrew, the way you would emphasize something, you would say it twice and you would say, Holy of Holies, or you would say, Song of Songs, or you would say, King of Kings, or Lord of Lord, Lords. And, and here's what the author has done for us. Vanity of van the highest degree of absurdity. This is what he's saying. Life is a double vapor. It is absurd. It makes no clear sense. The things that happen to me are totally beyond my comprehension. You know what this is? This is taking the Deuteronomic code, which was, if you work hard, good things happen. If you be good, God will be good to you. And takes that and just throws it out the window. Some of you, you, you live this. I, I worked hard all my life. I've loved my children. I brought them to church. And now this... This, this bringing it up. This perplexing pain is there for a reason. Dry, it, this book reminds us, it's asking questions that the rest of the Bible answers. It drives us to the mercies of God found in Jesus Christ. Life is perplexing. Let me give you a fourth thing I think we'll learn from this book. And that is life is Short. Short. Vanity. That word vanity, it, it's used five times in verse 2. We talked about what it means. It, it's, a, it's a vapor. It's a puff of air. You're, you're here one second, gone the next. And the older you get, the older you get, the, uh, some of you older people can, I'm putting you older than me, they can testify to this. I feel it, man. The, the older you get, the faster time passes. That's why I went to church. It was like an old man in a hurry. Well, every old man ought to be in a hurry because he don't have long. Isn't that, what, uh, isn't that what James says? James 4, 14, James says that you are a mist. You appear for a little while and then you vanish. The psalmist says it so beautifully over and over in the Psalms and Psalm 103, verse uh, 15 and following, the psalmist writes, As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower in the field, for the wind passes over it and it's gone and its place knows it no more. Look at the contrast. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting to those who fear him and the righteousness to his children's children. So, so the point of Ecclesiastes is, hey, look, life is short. Read the other 65 books and, and turn your life to Christ and live your life for Christ, the time that you have left. Isn't that what, um, you can look him up sometime, Count Zinzendorf. Count Zinzendorf preached against you feeling like you need to leave a legacy. Count Zinzendorf said that a Christian's responsibility is to preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. Life is short. Let me give you a fifth thing to consider. Nothing is reliable. Nothing. That's what the text seems to say when you read it, vanity of vanities. Look at verse 2, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Nothing lasts. Cars are going to end up on the scrapyard. Houses are going to break down. Buildings are going to rot. 
I served two churches, my first two churches in Mississippi, both of them way out in the country were churches that have been there since the late 1800s. We had the chance to serve in some of the original buildings in those two churches, and to this day, those buildings have been torn down, replaced with brand new brick buildings. Nothing lasts. Clothes wear out. Don't, don't look to build a legacy. Legacies fade. And so here's what the preacher does. He makes this sweeping statement that all is havil, all is vanity. Only one thing, only one thing remains and matters. The Bible says that it was Jesus who was slain from the very foundation of the world. And you can come and put your full weight, you can put your life and your, your pain and your hopes and your frustrations and your worries and your sin and your junk, your addictions, right here on the cross of Jesus. Let me give you a sixth thing to consider. And that is that drudgery, drudgery means something. You see it in verse 2, vanity. The, the, the word vanity is havil. It's, it's a breath. It's, it's, it's built into the very creation order after the fall. Wasn't there in Genesis 1 and 2, it shows up in Genesis 3. The idea of vanity, havil, is built into the creation order after the fall. Boredom, ever get bored? Boredom, if you hate your job, loneliness. That, we, we have to go all the way back to the very beginning of the sin of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve lived in paradise. They sinned. God cast them out of the garden. And listen to just a little bit of what, of what God says to Adam. Genesis chapter 3, at the, I'll start about the end of verse 17 on to verse 19. This is, what, this is what the Lord said to Adam. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you will eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it will bring forth for you. You'll eat the plants of the field, verse 19. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were made, and to dust you'll return. It, you realize that this futility, this struggle, what you go through, when your health breaks or your, your heart breaks, that struggle is there to make us long for another world. Drudgery makes heaven real. Drudgery means something. Let me give you a seventh thing to consider. From the book of Ecclesiastes and especially from this word vanity. Number seven, you are more fragile than you think. You, strong man, you, leading woman, you are more fragile. That word, havil, vanity. Uh, the next time you're out in the cold, I, I did it this morning when I walked out to start my car, and I did it, I checked it again as I was walking from my car to the building here. Next time you, you're outside and you can actually see your breath, so breathe and you can see your breath when it's cold outside, I want you to count the seconds that you can see your breath and that's how long you last in relation to eternity. I mean, it happens. You, I mean, a couple of days in a row, 10,000 cases of COVID. You can see it all over everything. You can get it. Something happens to your heart or you... Pick up an infection, you don't know where you got it, or someone you love is in a car wreck, or they pick up the wrong medicine, or there's an unseen malignancy. All of these little things that, that are here in life that can take us into death are here. It, it's here to point us to a couple of things. One is the grace of God. Isn't it grace that He would actually save sinners like us who are just a breath in eternity? That's grace. 
We should fall on the grace of God and trust the grace of God. I think it also points to the love of God. It's amazing to me that, that He would love people, not only that live so short, why would He waste His time, but live so short and sin while they're on earth. That He would love us enough to send Jesus to save us. You should rest in the love of God. You should feel loved by God. I think something else. That is the joy of God. That you actually can live this life for as long as you have, and you can live it in the joy of Christ. One of the great things about Ecclesiastes is God's people can see things as they are. We see how terrible things are and still have joy because our joy is not in this world. Our joy is in Christ. I'll give you one last thing. We'll call it a day on the introduction. That is, life doesn't make sense, but neither does grace. Life doesn't make sense, but neither does grace. We, we've talked a lot about this word vanity, the word havil. Uh, it shows up in Ecclesiastes, and many people think that the writer of Ecclesiastes, that he's reaching back to the very first time that this word shows up in the Bible. It's in Genesis chapter 4. It's in a proper name. First time it shows up is in the name Havil or Abel. Genesis chapter 4, Adam and Eve have had two boys, Cain and Abel. You read the story of Cain and Abel. Abel, if you go and read it carefully, you find out that he never speaks a word. He there's nothing he ever says. All we see is one moment he's here, the next he's gone. And the story goes that, you can go back and read it if you like. The story goes that after Cain kills Abel, God comes and speaks and what have you done? And this is what he says to Cain, the, the blood of your brother cries from the ground. Now that cry is for vengeance. I think you can put a, put a thumbnail right there, flip all the way over to the New Testament, draw a straight line to the blood of Jesus. And the blood of Jesus doesn't cry for God's vengeance. The blood of Jesus cries for grace and mercy for all who will believe. The truth of God is... We don't deserve anything. The love of God is He gives us everything. And I'm asking you this morning to, to not build your life on lies. Build your life on the love of God found in Jesus Christ. Will you join me as we pray together? As we go to a time of prayer and meditation and what we've heard, let me invite you to bow your heads just for a moment. If you're watching online, I'd like to invite you to take a moment and send in electronically a way that we can pray for you, or maybe you'd like to know more about what it means to give your life to Jesus. If you're here in the room this morning and you'd like for one of the pastors to pray for you, you can do that, or you can see us after the service. It's a good time just to say, please pray for me in this regard. Before we go today, I just want to encourage you to pick up Ecclesiastes. Add it to your reading. Get to know the God of the Bible as he shows himself to us in Ecclesiastes. Father, thank you for the goodness you give us in Jesus. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for taking away from us the things that don't matter, that we might cling to the things that do matter. We ask you to help our hearts now, heal our wounds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.